We're at the chalet. This is the first time we see Samuel and Sandra together. They're engrossed in a conversation in English. She's sitting at the table in the living room. He's in the kitchen. His back is to Sandra. He puts his phone on a shelf and finishes preparing pasta with bolognese sauce while replying to Sandra's last remark. The tension slowly escalates. You can't get me to cancel out of the blue. You have to give me more notice. No, I'm not just asking for these three days. It's bigger than that. I'm talking about the overall organization. It's not working for me. I told you this. Well, what do you expect me to do? I'm not going to just cancel. I mean, it's part of the job. You have to organize yourself differently. Oh, okay, well, I, how am I supposed to organize differently on my own? You know we have to plan things together. I'm not just going to leave Daniel alone because you're off doing your own thing. So leave him with Monica. I don't understand what the big deal is. Three days a week? She's not at our disposal. We'd have to pay her for that. We can't afford it. I need time, not just a few hours. I'm talking about blocking out time for myself for the whole year. This isn't working for me anymore. So organize your time differently if you want to. That is up to you. This is delicious. <laughs> Sandra, when was the last time you helped him with his homework? When did you replace his gaffer tape? When did you ever take Snoop to the vet? There's a ton of things that you don't even give a shit about, and that's the time that I'm talking about. Darling, the book just came out. You know very well that that is, that is what yeah, it's this It's always time is. just this time. Whether you have a book out or whether you're writing or you need space to figure out what to write or when you're invited to who knows where, look, I've been following your lead for years and I'm not okay with it anymore. I can't do anything with my time. Do you understand? Do it's I not my time, it's yours. force you to teach? Do I force you to homeschool Daniel? Nobody's forcing you. I mean, if you want to make time for yourself, I've never stopped you. <laughs> Are you fucking serious? I cut my course load in half this year to gain time, and it's still not enough. I have to finish renovations, plus I'm dealing with everything else. Why do you refuse to talk about it? Why can't you admit that it's how things are divided between us? Because you're wrong. I don't owe you any time. I do my part. Come on, let's, let's not start taking inventory. Let's relax. We love each other. When you decided to homeschool Daniel three days a week, I told you, be careful. It's a beautiful and generous choice, but you don't have to. I told you that you would probably what? end. What? Say it, say it, that I would have to spend more time with my son? Well, I'm, I'm glad I didn't listen to you. I wouldn't have had the relationship I have with him today if I had. <laughs> the relationship I don't have is what you're saying. No, I, I didn't say that. I am saying maybe, just maybe, things aren't, Things are a little out of balance between us, and I'd like to take a look at that. Why is that so hard to discuss? First of all, I don't believe in the notion of rec reciprocity in a couple. It's naive and frankly depressing. And I think discussing it is a waste of time considering the state you're in. Seriously, all of this blah, 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 and more time is gone. And the time that's spent chit-chatting could be spent in silence or doing whatever you want to do if you knew what that was. I want to find time to write just the same as you. Then do it. I don't, know a, I don't know a single writer who's not writing just because he's got a son and a house and groceries to buy. I mean, stop whining about your scheduling bullshit and stop this logic which comes down to casting blame on me for what you did or didn't do. What are you talking about? I live with you. I plan my <sighs> life around you. If, I'm if, I'm imp if I impose what you're imposing on me, neither of us would ever be able to write. Oh, don't worry about me. I'll always be managed to write. Great. Great, I'm so happy. If you're so sure, adapt. That's all I'm asking. I do adapt. I take Daniel to school. Once a week. Yes, and we have Monica on Tuesdays. No, Sandra, you're being dishonest. No, I'm not. You are being nitpicky. You know, I have given you so much. Too much. Too, too many concessions, and I want the time back, and you owe it to me. Be fair. Are you insane? I don't owe you anything. It's because of your relationship with your son to protect yourself and, and your comfort because you get scared that you put yourself in this position and it was your choice to come here and start a renovation. It's your own trap and mm -hmm. I'm not the one who's, who's taken time from you. You've wasted it all on your own and you can't blame this on me. Okay, okay, now you're talking about the past and I could respond to that point by point, but fuck that. <laughs> I want things to change now and I want time to start writing again. Great. So go for it, and if you want my advice, go back to the one you ditched. That's your advice. Go back to the book that you plundered. Oh, so it's plundering now. We discussed it, you'd given up. You took the book's best ideas. How am I supposed to just go back to it? 
Do you realize how cynical that is, okay? P publish your version and say it inspired me. I'll admit to that. When something demands to be written, someone has to write it. It's almost Darwinian. Then again, it's an idea that is so like me, I could have had it myself. <laughs> That's so your vision of things. You have animal vision. You pretend to be obliging, but your logic is savage. Look at you. Look at you. Even your bullshit moralizing is a way to waste time. You should be flattered that I was inspired by you. I mean, that's life. Things circulate. Frankly, I hope you, you'll be inspired to plunder me someday. Each in our own territory. We take what we need, except you are not alone in your jungle. I live with you, and you impose everything. You impose your rhythms. You impose your time. You impose the language. Even when it comes to the language, I'm the one meeting you on your turf. We speak English at home when Daniel should hear French. We hardly ever speak. Well, yeah, you never wanted to learn French, just like you never sacrificed a second of your time. Everyone always has to meet you on your turf. Bullshit. I'm not on my turf. I don't speak my mother tongue. Yes. But you don't speak mine either, even though we live here. Well, yes, it's a middle ground. In fact, I'm not French, and you're not German, but we have to meet the other on their turf. We create a middle ground, and that is what English is for. That is our meeting point, and you can't blame but me for that. But we live in France. That is our reality. Stop being evasive. Daniel hears you speak in a language that has nothing to do with his life, and you impose this on him like everything else. We're on your turf all the time, and I just have to follow. But we are in your country every single day. I have to accept living in your hometown, the people you grew up with looking down on me whenever I make the effort to smile, and I don't think me living here counts as meeting on your turf. Yeah, well, you never smile at anyone. And and that's why you love me, right? Because if you wanted some dumb bitch who grins at your friends on the ski slope, you, you would have picked someone else. Uh, you really have no shame. You know, that's your superpower. It allows you to see no one but yourself. I see you very clearly. I just don't see you as a victim. You impose your way of living and eating and speaking and even fucking. I could never get you to fuck any other way. You just expect me to follow your lead. That's your notion of what a couple I is. I don't give a fuck about couples. I don't have a notion. I'm not stopping you from fucking the way... I'm stopping you from fucking the way you want. Seriously, be honest. Who's been refusing to fuck since the accident? Oh, you know damn well I meant before. When... What, what did I ever refuse to do sexually? Everything. Plus, I have to accept the fact that you fuck other people. I do not fuck other oh, people. Oh, come on. Do not deny once, it. Once, and you cling to it in order to suffer. All you do, you do that all the time just to make yourself a victim. No, I am just telling it like it is. You have fucked other people several times and imposed it on me. I'm not a victim. I am a man scorned, plundered, and scorned. I can live without sex, but not forever. Oh, so you're blaming me. I'm the one who's frustrating it you. It doesn't matter who is frustrating who. The frustration is there, and we're both dealing with it. Personally, I refuse to rot inside, so I find solutions. And at this point, sex is just a question of personal hygiene. You impose your solutions. Which are solutions for you only? You don't give a shit if it hurts me and Daniel. I am not imposing anything on Daniel, and don't you talk about Daniel. You made us live here among the goats and you complain about a life that you chose. You're not a victim. Your generosity conceals something dirtier and meaner, but you're incapable of facing your ambitions, and you resent me for it. But I'm not the one who put you here where you are. I have nothing to do with it, and you aren't sacrificing yourself. You chose to sit on the sidelines because you're afraid, and you're afraid because your pride makes your head explode before you can even come up with a germ of a... <sighs> embryo of an idea, <laughs> and now you wake up and you're 40 and you need to blame somebody. Well, you are to blame, and you're petrified by your own standards and your fear of failure, and, and that is the truth, and you're smart, and I know you know this, and Daniel has nothing to do with it. You're a fucking monster. Take back what you said, you fucking piece of no, shit. No, he's told me countless times. Too hard. Did you know that? Take that. Take it back. Kids want to please their parents. Daniel's telling you what you want to hear. He can feel your guilt, and he wants to reassure you. You never stop feeling guilty about you're him. You're a cold-hearted, selfish monster. You're shameless. You're callous. You have no pity. And you have way too much for yourself. You're so cold, I can't take any more of your fucking ice. It's brutal. It's violent. You are violent. Do I'm you hear I'm violent me? because you've become, become insubstantial, and I can't take any more of your mediocrity. Just... 
just die. <laughs> I'm lucky. You're the only lawyer that I know. Plus, I like you. Not great reasons for handing your life over to someone. But you're good too, right? <laughs> you look like a dog, a beautiful dog, <laughs> beautiful basset. It's funny you say that. I have a theory that I can't trust someone if I can't put an animal's head on them. So what am I? I'm not sure yet. What, after all this time? Do you remember me from before? When we first met? Yes. I don't. What was I like? Uh, you were lost. Lonely and ambitious, and I was hopelessly in love. I don't remember a thing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you really drove me nuts sometimes. I'm innocent. You know that, right? Yes. I mean, really? Yes. But in your head, you're thinking, aren't you? When you look at me sometimes, like, like right now, it's like you're judging me and I don't know what you're thinking. Well, I think a lot of things that I don't tell you. If I did, you'd fire me, too to sweet. Then you're fired for hiding mm. things from me. Well, if you want to fire me, you'll have to pay me first. Seriously? I'm handing you celebrity on a fucking platter. You'll be set up for life. Set up for what? I don't know. Give me a minute. <laughs> I'll come up with something. <laughs> what are you thinking now? That this is nice. Happy to oblige. <laughs> I want to drink all night. I can't feel the cold anymore, and it feels great. Same. <laughs> My brain is numb. I can't feel a thing. It's just so nice. Cold is good. <laughs> they look at each other with a half smile and kiss. It's a mix of a friendship forged between former lovers and comfort. I would like to read an excerpt from one of the defendant's novels, the one before the last, The Dark House. No, 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 okay? We're not here to judge fiction. This is not a jury for a literary prize. We're judging based on facts. Your Honor, if we go down that road, everything will be warranted. In 2016, Mrs. Voiter declared, I quote, all my books are closely related to my life and that of the people I know. I object to this. She's always claimed she's written works of fiction. In her first book, she recounts her mother's death. In the second, the falling out with her father. In the third, her son's accident. I'm going to stop here as the list could just go on. Obviously, Mrs. Voiter's books are part of this trial since she infuses them with her life, her reality, her marriage. Go ahead, but be brief. Let me specify that this is a woman talking about her husband. He had stopped complaining. He had given up. She observed him, and she found his resignation revolting. Then an idea came to her, like a glimmering possibility of freedom. You are taking the possibility this out of, of his disappearing. Further along, how to kill him? What to do with the body? The weight of his body? She looked at him and could think of nothing else. She already saw it dead. This body, lost to her desire, was no more than a weighty object. You were ranting based this on a detail. This body that she had loved and which had become so burdensome had to disappear. I am going to give this some context as you are not. Okay, this excerpt is the musing of a secondary character on the verge of insanity who doesn't follow this delirious thinking through. A novel isn't life. An author is not her character. Yet novels can express deeply buried desires, desires through the characters. How not to draw parallels? By focusing on facts, that's how. We must refrain from drawing any such parallels. Otherwise, I could just read Stephen King's entire body of work and prove to you he's a serial killer. <laughs> However, Stephen King's wife didn't die in suspicious circumstances. Focus on the actual circumstances and the facts. Do your job. Mr. Renzi, I strongly advise you to calm down. Mr. Attorney General, I strongly advise you to follow Mr. Renzi's first piece of advice. Aside from the slap that you admitted giving, had you ever previously hit your husband? No. That was the only time. So you have always been, under any and all circumstances, this admirably good soul, a thoughtful and altruistic person who prevents others from hurting themselves, as this recording attests to. This is biased, imprecise, slanderous, and out of This is too much for me to part up with. I rest my case. Thank you. <laughs>
Exterior day, forest, near the chalet. Daniel and the dog, whose name is Snoop, on a leash. <laughs> Walking the snow in a small wooded area a short distance from the chalet. Cautious, the child has its habits. Specific landmarks like certain trees that he touches and recognizes. Then he sits for a little while with his back against a tree. The light changes, we watch the elements transform as the sun warms them. The snow starts melting in the forest. Exterior day, forest near the chalet. Daniel comes back from his walk. The song is still blasting. When they use the chalet, Snoop starts sniffing as if alerted to something. He lets out an abrupt, nervous growl while pulling Daniel towards the house. Near the front door, the child trips over something on the ground. He freezes, lowers himself down slowly. His hands hesitantly reaching out in front of him. He touches someone's clothes. It's a body lying on the ground. We see blood in the melted snow. Daniel gropes about, touches the black hair, the face. He's suddenly overcome with panic and screams. 